Howdy, lieutenants and economists. The most volatile, evil, disgusting things on the planet, humans. If you have a video request, you can always go to assholeconsulting.com. Yeah, I am gonna charge you, kids. And that is the importance of not fucking up. You are such an asshole! Hello everybody once again, uh, this is the old captain here and we have, uh, I had to economics again today, this is an economics request, comes from uh, a regular client of ours who, who does not ask easy questions <laughs> and they're, I know the answer, but the problem is um, translating it into what normal people who have sex uh, uh, understand, not nerdy economists, it's like, oh yeah, I'm well, gonna fucking uh, swaps, you know, credit default swaps, yeah, of course, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> and he has a, well, I'll just read his request, and if you have a request, you can go to assholeconsulting.com, or I, the only, world's only professional asshole, blah, 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 blah. Hello, Cappy, great video on negative interest rates, pretty much confirmed my suspicions, I have a re request regarding derivatives, what are they? I don't think they can have any intrinsic value like a stock, but derive their value from that. You are correct. I have read the total market for derivatives exceeds world GDP. Yeah, we'll get there. That makes no sense to me, so can you explain that? I have heard these instruments are basically just gambling tools. I may be grossly oversimplifying it. And I was wondering if you can explain the different types of instruments to your YouTube viewers, like features like oil, cattle, etc., to forwards, interest rates, and credit. That will take... So long. I'll explain some of the kind of the key ones um, and explain them in general terms. But to address the general quote threat that uh, derivatives provide to the global economy, we'll, we'll get to that. Finally, to tie into the last video, how would negative interest rates or near zero interest rates affect the derivatives markets? Do you think anything good could come of it? If not, what negative things do you think could come of it? I will address that first, and then we'll get into derivatives. <coughs> it will magnify it. Leverage debt magnifies things because if you can borrow at very low interest rates, you can then take additional positions uh, in derivatives or any other kind of investment like that. And technically, derivatives aren't investments, but uh, but th let's peg, let's knock that one out of the park right now. However much money is going in at say seven percent interest rates, people can borrow at seven percent. If it's down to 0.25 and you're one of those close banks to the federal uh, federal funds rate that you can actually get a very low interest rate, yeah, it magnifies things and then bad things happen. At least according to the Austrian uh, theory of economics. Now I have taken notes. You know when I take notes, I'm very serious <clears throat> because I want to be thorough and um, not skip anything. So let's go through it. The first thing we have to answer is what is a derivative? Or a derivative, quite literally meaning it derives its value or derives from something else. Now there are many, many different types of derivatives. There are swaps, there's um, to a certain extent ETFs, exchange traded funds, leverage exchange traded funds, futures, options, forwards. They'll come up tomorrow, they'll come up with a new one that, that Wall Street decided to just shit out of its ass, okay? And we could try and go through all of them, but very simply, what it is, is it is a, a bet or a contract, and I don't want to use too much language here, that if the price of something goes up or down, uh, one person makes money, the other person loses money, and th the contract is merely the formalization of that bet, okay? And the easiest way to understand a, <clears throat> what, a, what a, a derivative is, is to look at the very first an original derivative that is an option, okay? Uh, now, going back into history, I mean, it was way back uh, in the olden days, and I, I wanna say it was corn, but something tells me it was hogs. Uh, going back to Chicago, slaughtering plant Chicago, long, long time ago. Look at the problem the farmer, we'll just use corn, the, the, the farmer faces, okay? How much corn does the farmer plant? Well, the farmer doesn't know what at the end of the day, his corn, after he reaps and sows his corn, what he can sell it for per pound or however we measure corn. <clears throat> now that's a pretty big risk. You don't know what the weather's gonna be like. You, and, and let's say you have a great growing season. You think that's good, not necessarily, because if you have a great growing season, all the other farmers are gonna have a great growing season, and then the market is flooded with corn, so the price of corn goes down. So to hedge against this risk, to, to insure against this risk, Farmers would enter into contracts and they would go and buy options. And don't worry about who you're buying it from right now. Farmer's going to go to a market and it's going to buy options. And what the option will say is it's like a guarantee, a contract that says, okay, Farmer Brown, uh, we guarantee you that we will pay you 
X dollars for each pound of corn that you produce. And who writes this contract, who offers this contract, who takes the counterparty risks to it is a bank or financial institution that have done their actuarial studies, insurance company. It's the exact same thing like insurance. Like you say, I enter a contract with my automobile insurance. I pay my $150, $200 a month, whatever it is. And the insurance company has done their mathematics and they say, okay, well, we'll insure you for this amount per month. And they make money. And in exchange, uh, you get insurance, okay? Now, you may make more money if you didn't, you know, you may not get in an accident. The, uh, uh, the price of corn may be much higher than what uh, Farmer Brown had, but it's insurance. That's what the farmer is buying. Insurance in case the price of corn goes below what is profitable. Now, with options, it's quite a, a good term to use because it's optional. The farmer doesn't have to use that insurance policy. Let's say the farmer needs $5 per pound for corn for him to be profitable. So he buys an option that allows him to force the counterparty, the insurance company, the bank, whoever wrote against it, forces them to pay him $5 per pound of corn. So the price of corn could drop to a buck. It doesn't matter. The farm, Farmer Brown, he said he's good to go. He's going to get his five bucks. Let's say the price of corn is $7. He finally brings his corn to market into Chicago. <coughs> and it's seven. Well, he doesn't have to sell at five. He just goes into the market and sells at seven, and the option that he has to buy at five, he doesn't use it, okay? The, the insurance company made its money off of Farmer Brown. He doesn't have to use that option. He's only out whatever that, that option cost him. He doesn't pay five, the, the option is insurance, so he pays maybe 25 cents per pound to be insured against five dollars uh, per pound. So it, it's only a fraction of the cost just like insurance. And so he can go, so it's only, it's only an upper advantage to him. So that is what a derivative is. Now there are various and many types of derivatives. And they're not just based off of the price of agricultural products. There can be commodities, gold, silver, copper, oil. Uh, there can be stocks, you can have stock options. Okay, that's used to compensate a lot of executives and employees. There's interest rates. It can be based off of it. I mean, you can write a derivative off of anything, okay? So the, but the larger point, the original intent of these was to minimize risk, kind of the opposite of what everyone is fearing. Like, oh my God, these derivatives will throw us. Well, no, they're, they're insurance contracts written to uh, 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 counteract price swings. Another, and a more modern day example, for example, <clears throat> would be um, exchange rate risk, all right? You know, we have international companies, global companies. Let's say you're a U.S. company and you, uh, you want to open up a facility in Germany, all right? Well, you want to make sure that your costs don't vary too much because of interest rates, or not interest rates, exchange rates between the dollar and the euro, okay? Now, they're not terribly volatile, but let's say uh, um, all of a sudden euro, what would it, the dollar depreciates against the euro all of a sudden you know by 20 percent well now your cost went up by 20 percent because you're building in europe and the euro gained 20 percent on the dollar now things are 20 percent more expensive so once again you enter enter into uh, a currency option a current um, it's not current futures whatever uh, you enter into you buy a derivative that guarantees okay here's the fixed amount i can be guaranteed to get an exchange rate of you know one euro per us dollar not me having to pay a dollar 25 for one euro, okay? So you see how this minimizes risks, it, it, it um, consolidate and cements costs, cements profits, you know, your profits coming from overseas. So this, the overall point, or original point of derivatives was to lower risk. All right, now, <clears throat> one thing before we get into the evolution of derivatives, and that is we have to talk about notional value. Because this is what you guys see, and it's very misleading. Uh, the headlines say there's 1.4 quadrillion, which is a thousand trillions uh, for you liberal arts majors, uh, or 700 trillion, and the global GDP is only 70 trillion. Oh my God, we're going to die. And we have to put things in perspective. Notional value is the value of what the insurance policy or the derivative is written upon. And a very simple, let's, let's use this because this is funny. Let's say you and I were to take a bet, 
because that's all an option or a derivative is, is kind of a bet. We are going to guess the weight of Trigglypuff. If you don't know who Trigglypuff is, this is who it is. Okay, so Trigglypuff, we say, okay, she's 300 pounds now. How, what is her weight change going to be in a month? Now, her weight change is not gonna be that much unless she really pigs out or goes on some kind of extreme diet. But in a month, we are betting on the weight change. Okay, not the total 300 pounds that Trickly Puff weighs. So if I say, I'm gonna bet you, and she's gonna gain five pounds, okay? And you say, I bet you she's gonna lose 10 pounds. We are talking, what, two to three percent change. So you're, the, the actual money at risk is only two to three percent of the notional value. A more real world experience, uh, example would be interest rate swaps. Say you are an investor or you are a hedge fund and you are looking at uh, a loan or a bond value of $10 million. Now, in an interest rate swap, you're swapping interest payments. You are not the holder of that $10 million, the underlying principal. You're only betting on the three or 4% interest rate or what it changes even on that principal. So let's say you have an interest rate of 3% on this $10 million, that is 300,000, did I do that? Yeah, three, 10 million, 3 million, 300,000, right. So while the notional value is $10 million, the actual money at risk in terms of these derivatives is only 3% of that, 300,000. So when you hear 1.4 quadrillion, 900 tr a trillion, oh my God, and we only have this little GDP of the world, Ignore that bullshit, okay? That's, that's attention-grabbing headlines, which I will point out uh, the right-wing media uh, more so is a little bit guilty of that one. So that's not the actual amount that would be threatened. I mean, it's not like we're going to put world... We're not, we're not going to enslave the world, what is it, 1.4 quadrillion divided by like 20 years over? We're not going to... It's not going to happen because there's not that much <clears throat> at risk, okay? Now, where the threat comes in, the real one, is the difference between hedging and speculation. And this is where, where the risk really comes in. <clears throat> hedging, insuring, hedging your bets, that's where the phrase comes from, that's good, that lowers risk. And it, I don't wanna say no matter how big the market got, but no matter how big the market got, within reason, as long as it is used for insurance purposes, as long as it's used to hedge your bets, lower your risk, guarantee that Farmer Brown gets that $5 per pound of corn, or Trigley Puff doesn't gain more than that, that doesn't make sense, <clears throat> or your, your, your interest rate exposure is not more than 3%, or the exchange rate doesn't vary more than 10%, that actually lowers risk in the economy and the financial markets. But, here's the problem. What if you just wanted to bet on options. Let's consider a stock option, okay? You have a $50 stock price and a stock option that you uh, can pay, let's say the, the option costs you $2, okay? Now an option allows you to buy or sell that stock at a certain price. And let's say it's an option to buy the stock at $55. So you have the right to buy the stock at $55 no matter what happens to the stock price. So the stock is at 50, you have the right to buy it at 55. Well, that your option is worthless. It has no value. Well, why would you pay two bucks for that? Well, let's say the stock goes up to $55. Okay, now you, I'm sorry, um, $60. So is it $50? And you have the right to buy it at $55. You not pay 55 for it. You get, you, just, you get the right to buy for 55. Sorry to make this confusing. This is the world of options. So you have the right to buy it at 55. It's currently trading at 50, not worth a thing. Also goes up to 60. Now the option you pay two bucks for is worth $5. And the reason why is you can buy a $60 stock at 55 bucks. So you buy this $60 stock for 55 bucks. You immediately turn around and sell it. You made $5 profit for a $2 investment. That's a 250% rate of return, if I do the math right. So you could see where buying it, it's a bet. It's like a little bet. For two bucks, I have a really good shot at making, or not a really good shot, but there's a, there's a chance I can have a high rate of return. Uh, so this is where hedge funds, speculators come in, because not to delve too much into hedge funds, 
Hedge funds are basically complex mutual funds where they use complex mathematical formulas. The really smart quants and the IT people and the computer programmers and all those guys over at Wharton in the U of Chicago. They come up with these complex algorithms and these complex uh, uh, investments. They do butterfly spreads and all these different types of financial products. They, and, they, and they try to do what's called arbitrage where they have zero risk or at least minimal risk as possible <clears throat> and they make a lot of money. So even though they may eke out like half a percent uh, if they can leverage it, they borrow it, they can actually magnify those rates of returns to 30, 40, 50 percent, which is why you see, oh, I want to get into a hedge fund because they have such high rates of return. Well, that's because they're highly leveraged and they're very, very complex and they're using these derivatives. Now, here's the problem with hedge funds and speculators in general. Unlike Farmer Brown, they don't own the underlying asset. They're literally buying the options, the derivatives. So Farmer Brown has the corn. <clears throat> Farmer Brown technically has no risk. The only risk to Farmer Brown is what he may lose on an option. You know, that's like we lose when we pay car insurance so we don't get in an accident. Okay, I paid my six or hundred or twelve hundred dollars a year. <clears throat> that's out the window. But I was insured. Uh, these people don't even have the corn. They don't even have the principal. They really are betting. As, as highly complex and thought out and intelligent as their algorithms and their, and their arbitrage may be, they don't have any of the underlying assets. Now, if everything goes right, they make money. If things don't go right, then they lose money. And here it's okay to a certain extent. Let's say you're a hedge fund and you lose a lot, all your money. <clears throat> well, you and all your preppy little Chaz McChattius McStevenson the <laughs> uh, You guys lose your money and then you don't get a yacht uh, that year and then daddy bails you out. But let's say you're AIG or you're, if you remember, long-term capital or credit management, long-term credit management. I always confused it. Uh, let's, let's be precise. Come on, Clary, let's be accurate. Long-term capital? Management? Is it long-term capital? Yeah, long-term capital management. All right. Uh, long-term capital management was a hedge fund where they did all the advanced mathematics and, and I think it was something like, as long as nothing happens in Asia, we're good. And then the Asian currency crisis hit and blammo, they went up. And they got bailed out by the taxpayer because if they didn't get bailed out by the taxpayer, very much like the financial crisis of uh, 2008, uh, bad things were going to happen to the economy. There would be contagion, it would spread over to the U.S. larger, blah, blah, blah. So this is, I know for maybe some of you younger people who don't remember this, this is under Alan Greenspan's watch, and this was like a preliminary bailout. There was the SNL bailouts, there was long-term capital management bailout, and then the really big bailout that came along. AIG, you would think, well, AIG, that was an insurance company, right? And you would think, okay, insurance, they would naturally hedge their bets, their actuaries would get together, they'd take wise positions, uh, and they would, uh, you know, insurance is not there to be a high risk investment like a, a hedge fund. Yeah, but they did have a hedge fund division offshore, and that was highly leveraged. And that got the shit. And then, then we had to bail out AIG because of the same thing. Oh my God, what if all the rich people in Wall Street didn't have money? We can't let that happen. Oh, they might have to get real jobs. Um, another one, Enron. Uh, Enron's another perfect example. Their options. Uh, they're, yeah, they, they had weather options. They were taking options on weather, and instead of producing energy, which I think was what they were supposed to be doing, uh, that, among other things, got them into trouble, and uh, then everybody's pension went away. So that's the real risk, is when <clears throat> these too big to fail type companies or uh, pensions, uh, employers uh, gamble with people's pension money or people's money is, well, with Enron, they told everybody, yeah, you got to invest in Enron. You have to buy our stock. And so that was kind of how it affected. Uh, and then the company went bankrupt. Or AIG, so big, so many insurance policies, so many options. We have to go. They, they provide a, a, a threat, a risk to the, the daily functioning of these financial markets. And now governments have to come in and bail them out. So that's where the real risk of derivatives uh, apply and occur. Uh, now, there are other real risks, and I'm, I'm going to delve into them. So, we, and what it basically boils down to is 
what percent of the derivatives out there are speculation <coughs> versus hedging, okay? Now, nobody really knows. We have no idea uh, uh, what percent goes in hedging. There's two studies out there and they say uh, it, it looks like most of it is hedging, the in intended purpose for it, and the minority of it is speculation. But the truth is nobody knows. And there's two studies, I guess I'll go cite them later. But that's what we really want to be concerned about. It's like, okay, if speculators can go belly up like AIG, uh, long-term capital management, or that, if you guys remember that, that French rogue trader, I think it was Société Générale, uh, that was options trading too, and he kept betting, betting. I think it cost like the French taxpayer five billion. Uh, it, you know what percent? What what percent threat is there? I mean, if 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 it's eighty percent of the derivatives market is these guys betting and speculating, holy crap, are we in trouble? But if it's a minority, well, then maybe the the threat isn't that big, and we only have like these one time bailouts or multiple time bailouts. And even then, you saw what a threat it posed to uh, the global economy. So if we, there's no studies, it doesn't say, uh, um, you know, hedging versus speculation. There's no hard percentage. I put a call into one of the professors that did a study. I, I haven't heard back from him, but I'm not going to wait because I'm sure he, 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 it would be a ballpark measure anyway. So we really don't know. But here is, is the real risks uh, that we face beyond these rogue traders or these amoral uh, 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 hedge fund managers or people saying, well, we're too big to fail, so we'll just take you know the, the moral hazard risk, stuff like that. <clears throat> One, the real threat to a derivatives market is dramatic swings in prices or interest rates. Uh, most of the actuaries, I don't know if any of you remember Black Shoals, I'm not too bored, but there's like a percentage chance, there's a band where it's like, okay, here's what we expect is going to happen. Worst case scenario, best case scenario was the statistics of various uh, outcomes between the two. And within that range, that's what we're going to bet. Uh, if all of a sudden you have like a housing market crash, stock market crash in 1987, um, a default, an Asia currency crisis, something that goes outside the two standard deviations or three standard deviations, what, what's happening, <clears throat> that's what happened to long-term credit man or capital management. Then all of a sudden your positions become illiquid. You're bankrupt, and now we got to worry about bailing people out. Then, how big are these bailouts, and how much do they threaten the financial markets and the operation of an economy? Okay, so that's that's one of the real risks. So you have these really huge swings that go beyond the statistical expectations of these hedge funds, insurance companies, and anybody else that has not even necessarily speculative investments in derivatives, but hedging. So that's that's one threat. Another threat is the influence of debt and leverage. Let's say you take a hedge fund, and they are speculative, but the speculative investing is very small relative to the insurance and hedging aspects of the derivatives markets. Well, that's fine. This may not threaten the rest of that. But what if you leverage this up with a bunch of other people's money? This also happens because hedge funds don't just throw their own money in. They borrow. I mean, especially if you look at currency trading, you're leveraging sometimes a thousand to one. And when you take that much, you know, say just a hundred times, you could do five hundred times as well, a thousand times, multiply times a small amount. Well, now this little amount times two hundred dwarfs this, and so that's what the real. That's another threat that you really have to worry about uh, right there. And then, as happened in the case of AIG, long-term credit, Orange County, Procter and Gamble, you can threaten not just companies. That Orange County, entire counties, and as we saw in the financial current or uh, uh, the financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, the global economy. All right. Now, the global. Let's address the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, because a lot of people say, "Well, that was caused by derivatives." They'll say, "Oh, it was mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations." I don't necessarily. Uh, agree with that because mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations, you actually own the actual underlying asset, that, so we can debate that. Some people will say the financial crisis was caused by it, but that's just neither here nor there. Regardless, the point is, you could see where a handful, a significant amount, not, not, not one or two, but you get a handful of these people out there, handful of hedge funds, handful of insurance company, 
handful of large banks that have hedge funds under them, and they, they exist, and you use leverage, now you can see where the derivative markets pose a real threat to the economies of the world. Right? Now, how do we assess this threat? And without knowing what percentage is speculation versus what percentage is hedging, we don't know. And also, we don't know exactly how much there is in leverage on the speculation end. But I'm going to give you what I officially title Clary's Really Shitty Economic Estimates. And this will kind of at least put a ballpark figure in there. And I don't even know if we're in the ballpark. Maybe we're in the county uh, where the ballpark is. But just assuming, and then until we get some actual figures, this is my best estimate as to what kind of threat is posed by the derivative markets to the global economy. All right? Let us just assume the 1.4 quadrillion, uh, which is the highest uh, number I've heard, the 1.4 quadrillion uh, derivatives market out there is, that's the total amount of derivatives out there. I'm going to assume because you don't own the underlying assets. Remember, we're betting on how much Jigglypuff or Trigglypuff gains in weight, not our actual weight. We're not betting on the $10 million in principle. We're only betting on the 3% interest. <clears throat> I'm going to assume only 5% of that is the actual risk. So if we do that, we're only looking at $70 trillion in money at risk. All right. Now, let's also assume only 20% is for speculative purposes. Okay. The remaining 80% is for the original intention of what options and derivatives were for. And that is insurance and hedging. So 20% of that, uh, 70 trillion is only 14 trillion. You compare that to 75 trillion in global GDP, you're looking at a threat, total threat to global GDP of 19%. <clears throat> so if the all, not that, all of the derivative markets just collapsed, it just went all the way, the speculative parts, uh, you're looking at world GDP basically collapsing by a fifth. Now, that would certainly be cr uh, crushing, but not unrecoverable. And so I guess the larger point I'm trying to point out here uh, to answer everybody's question, what kind of threat do derivatives pose the global economy? Well, it certainly poses a serious threat. I mean, you collapse by 20%, that's pushing uh, uh, Great Depression levels. But it's not the misleading notional amount of 1.4 quadrillion where we're all slaves to each other for 20 years. Right? Now, of course, we don't know exactly. Like I said, these are Clary's really shitty economic estimates because I don't have any real figures to put into it. This is just my ballpark figures. And we didn't include any kind of leverage going on here. But in short, the, the derivatives threat that everyone keeps talking about, um, I don't think it's, it certainly is not as big as they talk about it because people just don't understand the difference between notional and at-risk value. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry... I, I wouldn't think, oh my God, the sky is falling yet. Wait for the derivatives markets to start crashing. Wait for, wait for that to happen. Um, but I think you could go to sleep at night and at least for now, not worry about uh, derivatives uh, turning you into the slave for uh, a good third of your life. Anyway, I hope that explained derivatives. Hope we, uh, we learned it's not as bad as it, it's still pretty bad. And uh, if you have any questions or you want to know something about economics and you're willing to pay, Go to assholeconsulting.com and uh, we'll take care of you there. Toodles.